going to the cloud. Thank you so very much, my brothers and sisters. At 12 noon, I greet each of you in the name of him who is our Redeemer, Liberator, Savior, and our Lord, whom I hope in God knows I continually pray that you are serving and genuinely worshiping every day and not simply on Sunday. Yeah. Well, once again, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we will, and we shall rejoice and be glad. And because I made that, because I said that in terms of an introduction, Reverend Martin. Yes. Uh, uh, hermeneutic, biblical principles of hermeneutic. Hermeneutic, it means the biblical principle, uh, and in our context, the biblical principle of interpretation. Uh, I think it's very important, very intrinsic, very essential that those of us who are connected to God, that we have the proper interpretation of scripture and not base it on what I think and not base it upon what you think. Because what I think and what you think, brothers and sisters, means nothing in terms of salvation. If we're going to help somebody, particularly those persons who don't know the Lord, who have who not literally connected to God, does not know the Lord in the pardon of their sin. Uh, we can't do that based upon our experiences. Though our experience is important, perhaps in the conversation. Not saying that your experience is not important during a conversation. Uh, or I'm not saying that your quote unquote testimony are not important. Your various testimonies are not important in various conversations. But at the end of the day, your experiences, my experiences, your testimonies, my testimonies cannot save anybody without the word of God being the primary emphasis. And that's one of the problems that so many people have, as I said to you over and over again, my interpretation of it is this. Well, my interpretation of that situation is that. Uh, your interpretation respectfully does not make it uh, when you're trying to help somebody. God left the interpretation when God left God's self. When God, when Jesus left Jesus' self and Jesus left the Holy Spirit, which is God and Jesus, inextricably intertwined. God never leaves us without a witness. Uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir today, but these Bible studies go around the world. And so many people, so many people uh, have... Uh, had bad interpretations and uh, as a consequence of that uh, um, it it affects quite a bit of people so with that said Reverend Martin if you would just go ahead and kick us off today uh, with our Okay. Let us bow in prayer. I am the Father, our Master Teacher. We praise and we thank you for another day of another day of grace and mercy, Lord God, and another day to learn of you. Lord bless First Lady Vanell and every family represented on this line this afternoon individually, collectively. Lord, you know what we all standing in need of. Father God bless according to your will. Lord, bless and anoint Pastor William as he feed us the word. And feed us, we can't keep it to ourselves, Lord God. Lord, we still need you down here. Bless the sick and, and uh, bless the homebound and the bereaved families, especially the Dawson family, Lord. Continue to hold us in the palm of your hand 
and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory as you anoint this lesson today. We love you and we glorify you and we just magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. I appreciate that so very, very much. And we're getting ready to proceed. What a very moving, moving prayer. And we are praying for the Dawson family uh, during their time of bereavement. Uh, um, I want to go back. I know I've told you all, I sent you all pages 17 and following. Uh, to page 26, but I wanted to go back to the bottom of page number 15 when it lends itself uh, to the three kinds of angels. But before we go to the bottom of page 15, which, which begins with Sherebiah and Sherebiah, um, before we go there, Last one that was speaking, uh, Reverend Martin. Uh, let me just say this before I get started. I'm giving a lot of questions today. And so, what I'm going to do is, I'm about to mute everybody. Please unmute when it's time for you to speak. Okay, that should get it. Everybody is muted. And now, unmute Reverend Martin, if you would. And I would like for you to share with me, or share with this class, uh, at least one thing that you have learned, at least one thing that you've learned with respect to angelology, which means the study of angels that you really did not know. Uh, and that's very helpful for me as a teacher. Uh, I work very hard, as you can all know, uh, it's not, uh, I say that unapologetically. I work very hard in making sure that all of this is put together and make sure that it is 100% accurate with respect to the Word of God. Not based on what I think or you think, but based upon the proper exegesis, the proper interpretation, the proper hermeneutic of the 66 books of the Bible whenever we discuss a particular subject. I want it to be 100% if there's such thing as plus biblically sound. One thing, Reverend Martin, with respect to angelology uh, that you've learned uh, from our teaching in the last two or three weeks that you've not let know of. Okay, I've, I've learned that they were uh, created on the seventh day and that uh, they uh, do not have the grace and mercy that is not their, their, their position, that's only God alone. And uh, I've learned that they do not recreate. They, are, they were created so they do not have other angels. Okay, so with that said, you said since they don't procreate, you're really, really saying then that they're not, they cannot have any baby, baby angels. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they'll never be able to have baby angels and you also discovered that uh, if you, uh, now that we've studied it quite a bit, I believe it was you that said that, hey, I believe I can put my angels still on the yeah. ship. What did you share about that so that everybody can hear this, that it goes around the world? Yeah, I, 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 I collect uh, uh, women angels and then when I start reading and only saw things in the Bible that seemed to pertain to the men angels, um, so I, I, I question that and that's why I brought it to you. Are there any women angels? And then every time I, I read, I get excited and the notes you sent this time, I, I was just too excited knowing that I don't have to give them away or put them away. I can put them back up on the, on the mantle. Thank you for that. Excellent. Excellent. Because you saw we see women and we see men and we did not talk about that based upon what we thought, did we? We based it upon the word of God. All right, so we are talking about now angelology. Anytime you see O-L-O-G-Y, it always means to study of. That's a Greek term, and it's a Greek word that means the study of. It's the study of something. We don't know what the study is until we get to the first part, until we deal with the first part of the O-L-O-G-Y. But we do know the latter part of O-L-O-G-Y, 
100%, always, always, 100% means the study of something. In this case, we have angel in the front, then O-L-O-G-Y, which is the latter part of the word. The first part of the word is angel. The latter part of the word is ology. Angelology, the study now of angels. With that That's said, yes. Dr. Williams, this is Stovall. Remember, you may get to this later on, but last week we were talking about the archangel and I did some studying on that and I found out that the name, the three angels that I had gotten, that information came out of the Catholic Bible. It is not in the, in the Bible that we use, so. Meaning that you got that from the Apocrypha versus the, uh, the 66th book. Yeah, of the Catholic. versus the Bible that we use. Right. There you go. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, I, Dr. Stovall. I want to share how I came up with those three, three archangels, and it did not come from what we call the Holy Bible, our living right. Bible. Well, I and, appreciate that. And the 66 books is the one that we have canonized, and then the early fathers, the early church fathers, the books that have been canonized are the 66 books that we share. Uh, and the canon, canon means law, a rule, and, uh, and then uh, the, the Apocrypha, which the Catholic used an additional 13 books. Uh, one of my favorite of the 13 books of the Apocrypha is when I had to do a major report, a major paper on COVID, T-O-V-I-T. So there's right. several of them uh, in the Apocrypha, of which uh, uh, we don't as share those of us who are Protestant, uh, we certainly don't uh, share their Bible as it relates to what has been canonized through scripture. We, uh, we go by the 66 books of the Bible. Thanks so much for that. Cherubim, the three kinds of angels. Cherubim is plural. Cherub means um, singular. Notice we had there 92 times. Uh, in 13 books of the Bible, the word cherub, a singular, a cherubim, which means plural. We found it in Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Hebrew. And then the word cherubim means to hold fast. We found cherubim, it's found 92 times in the Bible. In the word cherub, singular, it's found 28 times in the Bible. Then we went on, and you notice if you continue the screen, there's the word seraphim, a seraph. Seraphim uh, uh, is plural, and seraph is singular. And it's only found one time in the Bible, which is in Isaiah chapter 6, 7, and 8. And Isaiah chapter 6 opens up within the year of King Uzziah's death. I also saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train filled the temple. And two wings, two wings, two wings, which means the seraphim, uh, the seraph, uh, uh, has six wings. Uh, we're talking about the three uh, kinds of angels. Then we had uh, number three. The third one is the living creatures. And these four angels are referred and described in Revelation, not Revelations. It's found in Revelation chapter 4, 6 through 9, uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And Revelation chapter 15, verse number seven. With that said, that brings us right where we need to be. Now, basically and essentially, good angels are a servant. We found that in he find that in Hebrews 1:14, and God sends them for a service, a help. They are strictly good angels. Their function is to serve and take. Uh, and the, you see the word diagnosis, which means a believers, and in so serving the angels function as priestly messengers. Uh, this Greek word, uh, lead orgaga, which, uh, which, and lead orgaga numatata, numatata, which literally means liturgical spirits in the temple. Uh, they are liturgical spirits. Uh, um, you find that first word, li, it, or get top, that you can look at. And that, that has a lot to do with what we call our liturgical, liturgical 
liturgical color. It has a lot to do with the particulars as it relates to the temple. In our case, the church, what are our liturgical colors? Uh, they're very liturgical in the church because we follow a liturgical order. Now, in relations to God, angels, primarily angels, uh, primary responsibility our ministry is to worship and praise God. Their job is to worship and praise God. Their main job is to worship and praise God. And it's very important uh, that you have your Bible. And again, you have to uh, give the biblical references in everything we do. Everything we do. Uh, the Bible uh, of choice, my still recommendation, my still recommended Bible of choice in terms of version uh, is the NASB, the NASB of the New American Standard Version of the Bible, because I'm convinced biblically that it's the closest to the original, the original languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So I still suggest, and I will suggest that until the day I die, that the NASB is without a shadow of a doubt uh, very closest to the uh, original languages. You have some scholars now that working on the NIV and even the uh, uh, this English Bible, they're working with that to try to make it, you know, even though they try to make it simplified. Yeah, but you can understand it easily, but they're working on trying to keep from distorting the original languages. And that's very important there. And you have scholars that are working on that to this day. For example, back when I was saying about their primary job is to praise and worship God, they praise God. Psalm 148, 1 and 2, Isaiah 6 and 3. Now, we won't go through all of them, but would you look at that, uh, Sister Russell, and that uh, uh, I, uh, Psalm 148, 1 and 2, and since I'm looking at you, Miss uh, uh, Daisy Bank, you look at Isaiah chapter six, verse number three. And what are we looking at before the two of you bring that to our attention? We are trying our best to share without a shadow of a doubt that the primary responsibilities of ministry of angels are to worship and praise God. So let's look at that. Psalm 148, 1 and 2, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Psalms 148, 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. So now what I hear you say is, Praise him, all his angels and all his hosts. Remember now the Hebrew word host, it literally means angel. So twice you see why angels are praising God. What about it, Isaiah 6 and 3? Isaiah 6 and 3? Yes, ma'am. And one cried unto another and said, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So you're saying the person that said it in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, happened to be the angel. So while you're there, why don't you read, uh, why don't you read uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, and I'll tell you when to stop. In the, in the, in the year, year in that the king is a died, I saw also the Lord sitting up on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings with train. Wait, now, above him stood what now? Above it stood the seraphim. Okay, so it's a seraphim. That's what we just talked about in terms of some angels, seraphim, M-I-M, always means plural in the Hebrew word. So above it stood seraphim. They're talking about some angels, uh, 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 a type of 
angels, a group of angels. Above them stood the seraphim. And now let's look at the description of the seraphim. It's a, each one has six wings uh -huh. with train. He covered his face. And with his train, he covered his feet. And with train, he did fly. All right. So yeah. that's good enough, Mrs. Bank. I'm just trying to share with the world who watches and takes the Bible study, as all of you do seriously, that that the seraphim, it was not the cherubim at that time, nor was we were we dealing with any other angelic forces, but we were dealing with the seraphim, which means plural, and we all know by that passage of scripture of uh, that pericope that you just read that the seraphim has six wings. All right. Then they worship God in Hebrews 1 and 6, Revelation uh, 5, 8 through 13. Angels also rejoice in what God does according to the biblical reference of Job chapter 38, verses 6 and 7. They, they serve God in Psalm 103, verse 20. Revelation chapter 22, 9. They appear before God in Job chapter 1, verse 6, and in Job chapter 2, verse 1, and they are instrument of God's judgments, according to Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, and Revelation chapter 8, verse number 2. Angels also appear to be unusually active when God institutes a new epoch in the sweep of history. For example, they joined in praise when the earth was created. They joined in praise when the earth was created. Job chapter 38, verse 6 and 7 shared this with us, and they were involved in the giving of the Mosaic law in Galatians chapter 3, 19 and Hebrew chapter 2 and 2. And they were active at the first advent of Christ. And and we need to put that down as the first advent of Christ. So let me, while we're doing that, uh, I can always fix it since you all are watching some things on the screen. As you see, I did one letter and fixed it just that quick. All right, so there you go. So uh, we're acting as the first advent of Christ in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. And they were active during the early years of the church. We do know that the church started in the what? Book of Acts. Well, they hear angels were active in the incipient years of the church. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 10, verse 3, 7. Acts verse chapter 12, verse 11. And last but not least in relation to this part, they will be, they will be involved in events concerning the second advent of Jesus Christ. And we can find that during, in Matthew chapter 25, which, as you know, is a part of the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. It's theologically known as the Olivet Discourse. It also gives you the one, two, three, then the ABCs as to what is going to happen uh, at the parousia, of doing the parousia, meaning the return of Christ, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I, I can't stress enough how important it is since we're studying eschatology and we have studied eschatology and we continue to build on eschatology, which is the end time, which is the study of end time. You must include Daniel. You gotta must stop about halfway there to Matthew uh, uh, 25, 24 and 25. And then, of course, in Revelation, uh, as it relates, gives you three basic, basic uh, eschatological uh, viewpoint of the parousia of Jesus Christ. Of course, you can find also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, and following, and you can also find it in 1 Thess chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And of course, that particular pericope, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, lends itself to the rapture. All of the scriptures that I've just mentioned are not exhaustive to say the least, 
but they are basically where we need to be as we understand the philosophy and theology of eschatology. Now, it's important to understand that angels were active in the ministry of Jesus Christ. They were active in the ministry of Jesus Christ. For example, uh, Gabriel predicted his birth. The angel Gabriel predicted his birth. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 28. Let's take a look at that, sister. Everybody should have their Bibles now, because you never know what I'm going to call on you. Let's take a look at that, Sister Russell. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, Luke uh, uh, and Luke, uh, Sister uh, Stovall, Dr. Stovall, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 28, Matthew chapter 1, 20, Sister uh, Russell. Matthew chapter one, verse one, I mean, verse chapter one, verse 20. Okay. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Usually the person that brings the pronouncement, uh, as I've always told you before, is the angel Gabriel. What do you have, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 28? Dr. Stovall? I believe you're muted. must have a muted. No, I believe you're muted. You need to unmute, Dr. Stovall. Unmute. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, I don't even see her on anymore. Uh, maybe she's something that's clicked her off. But anybody can just take a look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, 26 through 28. Anyone? And in the sixth month, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin expound to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin name was Mary. And the angels came, un, came in unto her and said, Hail thy that are highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are there, blessed are thou among women. All right. So you're seeing here that here, this is what Gabriel, uh, Gabriel again, bringing another uh, announcement uh, to human beings. Uh, predicting the birth of Jesus Christ. As we talk about this, he went to Mary in that particular scripture, if y'all can recall, and Mary was a virgin. There are two Greek words for virgin. Once again, the one it happened to be Alma, A-L-M-A-H, and the other one is Parthenos, P-A-T-H-E-N-O-S, Parthenos, which both, both words mean a young girl that knew not a man. So the bottom line is, for those who don't believe in the virgin birth, uh, they try to go ahead and say that Mary had some other children and things of that nature. Uh, that's not going to work because uh, according to the scriptures that she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds, Luke chapter 2 now, Shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord was round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, 
and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, anthropos in the Greek, which means toward human God. But, um, Reverend, what I see um, when I was reading this and what uh, Lennon was reading, the, uh, the angel came to Joseph in a dream, and when he came to Mary, he came in person. Is that right? That's right, right. But it's still the angel, the point I'm making though, it was the angel Gabriel, who always used to come in person to bring announcement from God. Also, an angel announced his birth to the shepherd, and then, of course, I just read that, and then accompanied by praise by a multitude of other angels, of which I just finished reading. So let me ask you this theological question. Is Jesus ever referred to uh, uh, re ever referred to the, uh, in the Bible as an angel? Is Jesus ever referred in the Bible uh, as an angel? No. I think that's very important. And let, let's think of the answer is yes, we get ready to mm -hmm. give us some things, but only in the Old Testament. But let me clarify. The word translated angel in the Old Testament is from the Hebrew word malach, which means messenger. And sometimes that's very interesting, Sister um, um, uh, uh, Bank. Uh, sometimes malach refers to a regular created angel. Watch this now and stay with me. On one occasion, it signifies the uh, Christophany, that is the pre-Bethlehem appearance of Jesus himself. The context of the, of the uh, passage determines the usage of uh, the word. Uh, I really mean, uh, I, I mean to say word, so let's fix that right now, of the word. So he, Jesus, is called an angel in his, the, the father's presence in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9. And so let's take a look at that. He's also called the angel of the Lord in the various scriptures that we're going to take a peek at. Very interesting. But let's look at right now, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9. Now, each time we read that, I didn't say that he was an angel. He, I want you to, we're going to look at that deeply in a minute. He is called the angel of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9. Can you read that? I'll read it. In all their suffering, he also suffered. And he and the angel of his presence rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. Okay. And all we're trying to say to you is, uh, that's something for us. I wanted to put a little twist on it to let us get to, to give us some food for thought and see if this is possible. Can you read, uh, while you're reading that, sister, can you read that uh, uh, Genesis 16, 7, 9 through 11? Uh, would you read that at this point? Genesis 16, 7, and then Get in, uh, that same chapter, verses 9 through 11. Okay, verse 7. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness, also the road to Shur. Uh, verse 9. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Verse 10, then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. Verse 11, and the angel also said, you are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. Okay. Uh, what about uh, Genesis 22, 11 and 15? Genesis 22, 11 and 15. 
Okay, verse 11, and I'm reading from New Living Translation. Yeah, at that, Genesis 22 first, right? Then verse Genesis 11. 22 and 11? And 15, yes. Okay, verse 11 says, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. So what we, what we need to look at here is who is this angel of the Lord? Who is this angel of the Lord? Let's keep talking for a minute. Wait a minute. We're going to make sure we keep everybody together. Would you read Sister Jefferson, uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2? Uh -oh. uh oh. Exodus 3, verse 2. Exodus 3, verse 2. Praise God. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Okay, well, wait a minute now. Help, let's, and you should continue to remain on mute. Wait a minute here. Wait just a minute here, Sister Jefferson. Wait a minute. Uh, I thought that was the Lord, the Lord that was that was in the burning bush. According to the word, it says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Yeah. In and a flame of fire. Right. And what we're trying to say is that that was really God in the fire, and that was called the angel of the Lord. Let me hear back from you. Uh, so okay, question. Wait, before you leave that. So you're saying this is an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ because Christ is God. Yeah. And God is Christ. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? And I'm saying that all three, God, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, all three of them in one was involved Amen. in that. Yeah, they were okay. all involved in that. I'm just trying to, to, to just shake us up a little bit uh, that he had time that Jesus, the incarnate Jesus, was referred to as the angel, angel of, of the, Lord. the Lord. And you yes. can see on and on, I took my time, and to be honest with you, researched every one of these scriptures to make sure that it was right before it would go out to the world. So read that at your leisure. Look at this Genesis 16, 7, 9 through 11, Genesis 22, 11 and 15, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, Numbers chapter 22, verses 22 through 27, Numbers chapter 30, uh, I mean, and verses 31 and 32 and 34 through 35. And it can just go on and on and on. Look at it. That's a lot of scriptures for you to go ahead and take a peek at in your own right. And I would love for each of you, those of you who have further questions about this, we can study it when we get off of uh, the computer, of course, when we get off the Zoom. I would be glad to discuss it in more depth with you. Let us now look at page number 20. Furthermore, in the Old Testament, the title Angel of God and the Angel of the Lord, you hit it always referred to Jesus. The Old Testament, the title Angel of God and Angel of the Lord always refers to Jesus. Now, the reason that I put that in there, I again had to write a major thick, 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 thick paper in, in the seminary. Um, and the professor, in fact, I made my students do it when I taught uh, ITC, uh, Extensions. I, I took two, three groups for graduation uh, uh, when I was in Shreveport uh, from 2000 uh, to 2010. I had three graduating classes that went to ITC to get their certificate of theology. But be that as it may, one of the courses that I would um, 
one of the things that I would make them do is, uh, is they would have to write a paper again, is there Christology in the Old Testament? And they would have to explain to me, yes, there is Christology in the Old Testament, but show me the biblical references where that might be found. You're right, Sister Jefferson, that the Lord, Yahweh, yes, but Christa, meaning Jesus, Kyrios, meaning Christ, uh, Numatos, meaning the Holy Spirit, are all inextricably and in, in, intertwined. They are all inextricably intertwined, and they were all part of the Old Testament. So again, the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible, meaning the Old Testament, angel of God and angel of the Lord always refers to Jesus. <clears throat> and in the New Testament, there were two titles. And in the New Testament, titles never refer, two titles never refer to Jesus, but speak of Gabriel. You find it in Luke chapter 1, verse 11, and Acts chapter 27, verse 23. During the time of the life of Jesus Christ, an angel warned Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt to escape Herod's wrath. Matthew chapter 2, 13 through 15. So angels have always been a part of uh, this whole notion of Jesus Christ and uh, all of the working of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We also need to understand that Egypt, meaning these were African people. Uh, they were, uh, the Egyptians are African, contrary to what some folks think. They didn't want to give them the credit for it because these Africans, again, would build these pyramids in Egypt without any type of nail. They would build these huge pyramids, and they were the inventors of mathematics. Finally, people are giving credit where credit is due. Uh, and again, the Romans, uh, that did not look like us. Uh, did not knew that uh, Wayne Williams and some of you would one day uh, possibly read about or go to Egypt. Uh, they didn't want you to think that people that somewhat looked like you with Negroid features, that is with the wide nose, etc. They did not want. They did not want that to happen. So consequently, what they did with a lot of the speech, they would cut their noses off uh, because they did not want people to think that the Egyptians were that brilliant to build these big statues and build the pyramids. So the Romans uh, would cut your noses off uh, because it remind, remind future generations that these folks were Negroid, had Negroid features and were people of color. Just wanted to throw that one in. During his, uh, meaning Jesus' life, an angel directed the family to return to Israel after Herod died. So they were always participating in something for Jesus. During his life, uh, angels ministered to him, meaning whose life? During Jesus' life, it was angels that ministered to him after his temptation, Matthew 4 and 11, and his stress in the, the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22, verse 43. These angels are always help, Sister Pinky. They're always trying to help. So I love that song all night, all day, Sister Joy, Sister Beasley, the angels watching over me, my Lord, all night, all day, the angels watching over me. Uh, and it's very important that we have angels. Unfortunately, you also have some bad angels also watching you, but you also have the good angels and they are always in war and the good angels are always trying to keep you on the straight and narrow. Do you see where, where I'm coming from on that, Sister Pinky McMurray? Are you there? Yes, uh-huh. So do you see what I was saying on that? 
There's good angels, as I've told you before, and there's bad angels, but they are always warring with each other. And just like the devil, you know, you have the, the Holy Spirit and you have the demonic spirit. And we find that about the warring against each other, how we are always dealing with spiritual warfare. Ephesians, you know, dealing with we are not uh, wrestling with flesh and blood, but principalities. These people who think that they're all of that in a bag of chips and principalities, wickedness in high places. So they are always warring against each other. And the good angels always, and I'm convinced they will always win because the good angels makes up the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is over the demonic spirit. And because we are connected to the Holy Spirit, we have power over demonic spirit. We just need to release that in the name of Jesus. Because in Luke, again, James chapter 2, 19, the Bible says demons, these demons, they shudder at the name of Jesus. Okay, so during the life of Jesus, he said that legions of angels stood ready to come to his defense if called upon. Jesus would really want to say, sort of reminds me of about here, Pope saying that he was crucified and they really got him. No, Jesus gave his life, Sister Dr. Longano. Sister Visa, he gave his life. They didn't take his life. He had to fulfill the scripture. They didn't take his life. Because Jesus really said to them that Jesus can have legions of angels. Legions, remember now, in those days, represented 6,000 soldiers. Legions meaning 6,000. 6,000. So Jesus can have 6,000 angels on top of 6,000, on top of 6,000, on top of 6,000, on top of 6,000, on top of 6,000 uh, indefinitely. He could call on these angels to his defense if he wanted to. So Jesus, did. they did not take his life. Jesus gave his life to fulfill scripture. Does that make sense, Ms. Beasley? All right. Sister Joyce, are you there? You have I, to... I just right. got... I yeah, just there had... you go. There you go. So does that make sense to you? Yeah, make a lot of sense. So Jesus had to give, look here, he didn't, he didn't, they didn't take his life, he gave his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, that's very important for us to understand. Now at the top of page number 21, there we read at 10 minutes of the hour. Now after his resurrection, an angel rolled the stone from the tomb. Gee, these, these angels are very, very helpful. They rolled the stone away in Matthew 28. One and two. Angels announced his resurrection to the woman on Easter morning in Matthew chapter 28, 5 and 6, and Luke chapter 24, 5 through 7. And angels were present at his ascension in Acts chapter 1, 10 through 11, when Jesus ascended into heaven. And now he sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick, those who are living. And the dead. So we need to understand that as we deal with the affirmation of faith, the word quick. Have you ever wondered about that, Sister Joy? Uh, the quick and the dead. The quick meaning those persons that are living and then the dead. So quick mean people that are alive. And he shall come. The quick and the dead. Okay. So quick means people that are alive. Okay. For both groups. And this he shall come to judge. The, those who are living and those who are dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The universal church does not mean Catholic. We're talking about the universal church. The church universe. The Holy Catholic Church does not mean Catholicism because um, those of us who are part of, of uh, the, uh, the Protestant church, we do not adhere to the additional uh, additional 13 books of the Apocrypha. So it's the universal church. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Yes, the universal church. And you know the rest of it. And the resurrection of the body. So if we don't believe in the resurrection, we're in bad shape. And, and life everlasting. 
All right, thank you, Sister George. I wanted to just share that as you mute yourself back. After his second coming, okay. the voice of the archangel, which is Michael, will be heard at the translation of the church. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, could you look at that? Uh, uh, Sister Longino is working, but can anybody look at that, please, as we look at his second coming? Let's talk about this archangel, which again is Michael. He will be heard at the translation of the church. Someone look at First Thess, chapter 4, verse 16. We do know that there's First and Second Thessalonians. So let's look at First Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 16. The first person oh, in unmute. Okay. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead shall rise first. Okay, so here you're talking about the rapture, but he did say that when he comes back, he's coming back with the shout and with the voice of Michael. And the angels will accompany him at his second coming. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 7, and angels will separate the wheat from the tear at his second coming in Matthew chapter 13, verses 39 through 40. Uh, it, we, we hear the song all the time, God will separate the wheat from the tear. We hear that all the time. So would you take a peek at that, uh, Sister Pinky? Uh, if you're listening with us, I know you're moving around a lot in the office today, but Matthew chapter 13, 39, and 40. What do you have there, Sister Pinky? Do you have your Bible uh, near you? Matthew 13. Uh, yeah, you said Matthew 13, 39 through 40. Okay, let me give me a second. It's all right. You have to take your time. We're looking at the Matthew gospel, Matthew chapter 13, verses 39 through 40. I had uh, <laughs> called myself being smart. I skipped the second Thessalonians. Okay, Matthew 25, 31. Oh, Matthew 13. 13. Right. We're talking about how angels. And what's the verse? 39 to 40. 39 to 40, okay. Okay. Uh, the enemy who planted them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The workers are angels. Just as weeds are gathered and burned, so it will be at the end of time. So the workers are angels and they will assist God in separating the wheat uh, from the tear, right? Now, what is the twofold moral classification of angels? What is the twofold moral classification of angels? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, Faithful <laughs> angels are referred to as holy and elect. Angels, while fallen angels, uh, they are holy and elect angels. And while fallen angels are known as the devil's angels. Now, faithful angels are known as the holy and elect angels, while fallen angels are known as the devil's angel. How do we know that? Because of Mark chapter 8, verse 3, and 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. Also references uh, unholy and evil angels are found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Now, I want to stop it there, and I want you to unmute for a minute, uh, Reverend Martin, uh, and 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 I hope you can answer uh, uh, answer uh, some things that I want to talk about as it relates to as it relates to that. Um, do you understand, uh, uh, Reverend Martin, where I'm coming from uh, as it relates to how you have to stop every other word? Uh, before you go on to the next sentence, the next paragraph, because if you're not careful, 
people will begin to start thinking that it's something that you made up. And we don't need people to think that because second Peter, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop and I wanna hear from you. Second Peter chapter one, 20 and 20. Uh, uh, second Peter chapter one, 20 and 21 says, knowing this, that no scripture is given by one's private interpretation, but by men and women that were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it can't be based upon our interpretation. So if you have to stop every line and use scripture as, its re uh, uh, as the reference, then so be it. Because the whole idea is to make sure that we rightly, like in Timothy 2.15, rightly divide the word of truth. Does it make sense uh, what I just said? For example, faithful angels are referred to as holy and elect angels, while fallen angels are known as the devil's angels. Biblically speaking, well, how do you know that, Reverend William? Mark chapter 8, verse 3, and you can go and check it out and talk, see if you can find some information on these devil angels. And First Timothy, uh, 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 the devil's angels, and First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. Then you want to continue to look at, I continued to study by saying unholy and evil angels are also found in Matthew 25, verse 41, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Do you understand that? I'm not saying, Reverend Marty, Martin, that Mark chapter 8, verse 3, and First Timothy chapter 5, 21, or Mark, uh, Matthew 25, 41, a Revelation 12 and 9 are the only places in the Bible where that deals with the devil's angels. I'm just giving you some. So when you hear the word exhaustive, that means that it's not complete. Exhaustive. And you hear your pastor, your Bible teacher say to you all, all the time that this is not exhaustive to say the least. Exhaustive simply means that there are other places that perhaps if in the 66 book that you can find uh, where there are some more evil and devilish angels. Do you see what I'm saying? So the word exhaustive means that it's not complete. So I'm gonna say it again. So Mark chapter eight, verse three, and first Timothy chapter 5, 21, and Matthew 25, 41, and Revelation chapter 12, verse nine, as it relates to the devil's angels, once again, is not exhaustive to say the least. See it now? Yes, sir. All right, we're going to be yes. scholars if it's the last thing we do. Mm. All yes, right. Sir. So, um, that, I think your question was that you think that after every word, we need to stop and think about it, and uh, and and I agree with that. And then I also get the understanding that this Bible was not written by Blow Joe from off the street or wherever these people were were designated by God spiritual man that was designated by him to write his word. So when we read it, we know that this is directly from the Lord through them. And especially when we're reading our Bible and we see the writing in red, we know that that comes directly from God. All right. So anyway, we'll take a look at it. Uh, those okay. who have was, that, was that what you were asking? Yeah, that's right. And if you have any questions about anything that, you, that I talk about, remember always after Bible study, uh, people, you're to call me. And if there needs to be some correction, we'll make sure that we fix it for the next class. But it's very important um, that we uh, rightly divide the word of truth. There were men in with them. So I want to say that again. A lot of people saying they have one minute of the hour. I'm just going to throw this in. And we'll pick up page number, um, what is that page number? We'll uh, pick it up uh, at uh, page number 22, the bottom of page 21 and the beginning of page 22. Somebody please mark that the bottom of page 21 is the beginning of page 22. But let me go back and throw this in at almost one o'clock of the hour, it's 12.59. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, uh, a lot of people say that, first of all, the Bible was man-made, uh, that God had nothing to do with it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 takes care of that. All scripture is inspired by God. The Greek word, theonousis, 
which means God breathed every word of scripture. And God used 40 different authors and took over 1,400 years to put this Bible together. Now, of the 40 different authors, were they all, Sister Bank, men? The word, after all, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, knowing this, that no scripture is written by one's private interpretation, but by men that were moved by the Holy Spirit. Now we have to exegete the word men and see if they're talking about male or see if they're talking about humankind. And when we exegete it, the word men there, the word there is, is anthropos, which means humankind and not a not. Had it just been men, meaning male, meaning male, men, male, M-A-L-E, the Greek word there would have been anur, uh, anar, A-N-E-R. Uh, since the Greek word is anthropos, that eliminates anar, meaning male. So now it's saying that there are men and women. So transliterated, it, it would read this way, knowing this, that no scripture is given by one's private interpretation, but by men and women that were moved by the Holy Spirit. So when it comes to the Greek translation, knowing this, that no scripture is given by one's private interpretation, but anthropos that was moved by the pneumatop of the Holy Spirit. That's where we are. So that eliminates the fact. So we have to say now, based on that scripture alone, that there were men and women that put this, uh, that, that, that made up the 40 different authors for 1,400 years to put it together. The first Bible put together in AD 95. Yeah. And of the 786,716 words, 33,301 verses, 1,189 chapters. Makes up the word of God at two after the hour. All right. With that said, then, uh, was there someone about to say something about to close out here uh, on today? And probably next week, we'll pick up again at the bottom of page 21, at the top of page 22, as we continue our study, as we continue our theological didactics, as we continue our theological dedicate. Dedicate in the Greek, it means teaching, and kerygma means preaching. Dedicate, it means teaching, and kerygma means preaching. So as we continue our theological dedicate, or our theological didactics, as it relates to angelology, the study of angels. With that said, then, uh, Sister uh, Dorothy, are you there? If you could close us out in prayer. If not, we'll get Sister Bridget today. I know she said she was going to have to be working, and she wanted to listen to Bible study. All right, Dorothy, hey, uh, ready. Let us pray, oh, thanking you, gracious Father, Lord, for this day, Lord, for this meeting of the believers who by the Lord continue to be with our pastor as he leads us into your words we climb. continue to watch over those that are sick continue to watch over those that are breathing at this time sweet Jesus and Lord we'll continue to give you all of the praise honor and glory in Jesus name amen amen thank you so much uh sister Dante thank you so much for Reverend Martin and all of you that were on the Bible study on today I, I have a lot of respect for you because you have been following this ever since I have been your pastor. Uh, this stuff is not easy. And for you to follow it and to continue it uh, warms my heart. It really warms my heart to see so many of you that's taking the Bible seriously and not just something just up in the air, just some fluff, but you all are getting into the meat. You're getting into the depth. You are, you are the one, you are the one on here. I appreciate you that, that deals with the studying to show yourself approved unto God, work persons not ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You believe in cutting the word, the cutting it straight, the uh, dividing, rightly dividing, cutting it straight. I appreciate you, your understanding and your studying and wrestling as we together wrestle with the word of God. God is pleased with it, and I'm grateful 
And I hope to see you real soon. Uh, I'll see some of you Sunday at Sunday School at 9 o'clock. Otherwise, I'll see you next week, Wednesday, as we continue the study of angiology. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Have a super day. The, the, I want to let you know that the funeral service is incomplete of Sister Dawson. But we'll let everybody know uh, when that service will be taking place. Take care now. Have a great day. Bye-bye.